We are back with another segment of Dragoon X Omega Part 2. DXO2 is how I've been uh, tagging it on my Twitter account, by the way, where I am active underscore ATE. Last time we unlocked the air seal, and now we are heading through the Great Divide. The Great Divide is what separates our continent from the next, and I predicted that the game would start to open up a little bit once we got through the Great Divide. That remains yet to be seen as we go towards the uh, scary continent of Murka. Uh, in this game, Murka is, uh, at least in our section, a very uh, like a post-apocalyptic place, at least uh, according to the people around where we are. So we are uh, supposed to be pretty scared of going over towards Merka, but, you know, adventure on, we will. Uh, listening to the uh, the soundtrack in here, I was talking about it kind of reminding me of uh, some of the sounds used in other games, and I'm thinking about Home Alone 2, Lost in New York. This dungeon music specifically reminds me of that in the sound fonts that they choose. I didn't mean to suggest that this game is as poor of quality as uh, Home Alone 2, Lost in New York. But um, specifically the, the bass line that's used here. So I think it's the sound fonts chosen um, rather than the melodies themselves. Uh, the document that I have been using as we're going through a few um, t simple fights here. Um, most of the comprehensive information about this game comes from the Wikia page. I am not sure if the Wikia page was written and, or edited by the authors of this patch or if it was done by another person. But the, uh, the synopsis of the Wikia page is uh, kind of your, your walkthrough, where it's told in uh, narrative form rather than uh, do this, then do this, then do this form. So it talks about Sargon goes through the Great Divide to this next continent and then picks up this key item and then goes here and uses that key item on this, and then you understand. So um, that's where I've been getting a, a few of the hints moving forward on this. One of the problems with uh, doing a let's play of a game as you play it through blind, as uh, as I prefer to do, is that uh, you don't always know where uh, real delineated dungeons will be and, and where you'll run into small passages. So uh, this Great Divide, I uh, going into it, I assumed that it was going to be a uh, longer dungeon. As uh, we, we picked up a couple of healing items here, and then here is the, uh, the Globus. Uh, I'm not sure if that's supposed to be a... Uh, a belt or a wrist guard or a, a shield. I'm not quite sure what uh, that armor slot is. I mean, Final Fantasy 1 has a, a few different armor slots, although it doesn't really tell you uh, what the slots are, but you, but you have slots that go on your head, slots that go on your body, slots that go on your hand. Um, here is the sun seal. Pretty, uh, It's pretty clear that that's what that is, so the Great Divide is now open, so... Um, the air key gets you in the first seal. The sun key gets you in the second. I'm not quite sure why we needed to pick up two seals. Uh, the air key is the second key that you can get. The sun key we got a while ago. Um, so the gating of this game was uh, was solved as soon as we got the air key and could get into this dungeon. Um, the sun key just is must be a, a, an afterthought uh, to have in here. Obviously, it's nice to have things in sets. So I do understand sun key, air key. Um, although, if they're trying to align with the four elements, I would have expected a couple of other keys as well. Uh, the sun key being, you know, fire, maybe. So that we could have an earth key and a water key. In addition to the sun and air keys. But, uh, but we'll see. We'll see as we go through this game what the, uh, what the gating does here. Anyway, that is the Great Divide right there. So that was another one where I thought that that dungeon would be a little bit longer and maybe would even have a boss at the end of it. Uh, but indeed, it was just a short uh, two-room passageway. If I'm writing a, a hack or a patch for Final Fantasy 1, a total conversion patch like this, you know, if you're the designer, you only have the game to work with. Um, it's difficult for designers to build something new in that engine, so a lot of times they're taking existing tiles and existing areas, existing maps, and building them, um, changing up the, the tiles and... and uh, entrances and exits. So here we are in Merka, by the way. So we made it to the post-apocalyptic nightmare of the uh, northern part of this continent. And uh, there is a hole. <laughs> um, this hole is actually the control room for the rail jets. Uh, the rail jets are on this continent. They are, you can see them in some parts of the map. They are raised tracks. Um, they're like railroad tracks. 
They are up above the landscape, and uh, it looks like they lead all over the place. They, um, they take you places that uh, I don't have access to yet. These robots in here have uh, possession of the last uh, remaining railjet from the ancient society that uh, used to be here. We'll, we'll see more about them as we go to the next couple of towns in this northern continent. Uh, but these robots are jealously holding on to their remaining railjet because um, that's their transport around. We, haven't, we don't see it in action, the railjet. Here's the control room. And uh, here this robot says we intend to keep it. And so the uh, railjet is kind of my next uh, big key air item I need to, to get to get around this part of the continent. There's actually a few dungeons I need to get through before we actually can pick up that railjet. Um, this dungeon is where we start seeing um, some more difficult battles. Uh, these bandits have a very high back attack rate, which is, you know, not surprising. There's also a random battle in here with, I can't remember the name of the monster, but I think we see one. Uh, there's a robot named X6. This is a, a subplot looks like we're going to have to take care of. I lack a substance with the, with the physical properties to facilitate working on uh, nano machines. Um, they're called Pharos, I think. They're, they're huge red monsters that appear as random battles. Thankfully, you can't escape from them, but they do obscene amounts of damage. So they're meant to be just kind of a big, I don't know, I guess a damage trap. And uh, even as my character is power leveled, and uh, that gets even uh, more, there's the railjet track. That gets even more amplified. They still are too difficult to uh, to normally take down. So you're having to rely on RNG to escape from these things within, um, you know, you have two or three attempts to escape from them with full health at uh, levels that you are. One of the criticisms that I have seen about this patch is its grindiness, and the designers did uh, put together an easy patch for it. So there is a, uh, so it looks like this would be an entrance or a station for the railjet. Uh, but again, we can't get to it. Uh, this is not with the easy patch that was uh, provided by the designers of this one. The easy patch, I think, um, changes the experience or gold curve. I'm not sure in, in all the ways that it does that. But um, I'm playing it. There's Here's one of those things called a Pharos. And at first I thought it was a boss because you can see one hit, it does 88 damage right there. So if I had not escaped on that particular uh, escape attempt uh, and that thing had gone again, it would have uh, taken me out. So um, as we go up around here, we're going to go towards a town called uh, Eisenfort, and uh, to the north there is an old, uh, there is an old, not a mine. Uh, there's an old, an old passageway up there. We're about to head down to, uh, to a mine. There's an old passageway up there, the um, aqueduct up there. That's what it is. Or no, I'm getting that confused anyway. Sorry, so the, aqu the aqueduct will come a little bit later. Uh, I apologize. So here's another pharaoh. So anyway, we're going down to Eisenfort. And here we'll see Eisenfort um, is kind of a snowy, icy town. So there's a mine down there. And then here's the town of Eisenfort. We're going to look at what the people say, look at the stuff in the shops. And we're going to head down south to the mine. So Sansia in the southwest. I'm uh, just looking at the armor shop. We have a couple new things. I'll do my buying and selling a little bit later. This is uh, Eisenfort, where they tell us the name of the town. I assume that's a reference to uh, Isengard from uh, Lord of the Rings. Uh, there's a laser gun. I picked one of those up in the uh, uh, in the other dungeon, the Slag Mine, to the south, and I believe that's the uh, the area, the little hole in the ground. And so here's a clue to about the ancient technology. So there's the cave that goes to the Urus Desert, and that is what is to the north um, of this continent. It's not the aqueduct that's where we're heading um, once we get through that mine. But uh, yeah, there's a cave that goes to the Urus Desert. That's going to be in the next video. Uh, so here we pick up um, a couple of new spells. I don't have charges for that as of yet with this recording, but Fission and Outwarp. Fission is a single targeting damage spell, and Outwarp... It works like the warp spell, or the exit spell, I believe, uh, specifically in Final Fantasy 1. Um, it takes you uh, out of a dungeon. A warp spell is a black spell in Final Fantasy 1, and that takes you back one floor. Here's another story hook. We have bacterial bronchitis. Uh, poor Anna is sick and uh, dying of a very real-life infection. It's actually kind of, uh, I think this is an intentional anachronism 
this is another uh, locked door, so I assume I'm going to get a key for that eventually. But uh, there's a couple of times where we see references to uh, real world planet Earth, our existence, human problems like uh, bacterial bronchitis. Um, where we ha we're normally in a fantasy setting, you would not think of uh, real life diseases uh, in inflicting the people. Um, so to the east there, there is the uh, the hotel or the inn right there, but uh, I'm skipping all of that and we're going to go right down here to the mine. Um, so assume that I stayed at the inn. I did some leveling before we get to the mine here. And uh, these enemies right here, these, these kind of Lamia looking enemies are actually pretty annoying. They have some uh, high damage attacks, but I'm noticing that enemies in this area of the game have uh, morale scores that are a little bit lower than what their abilities are. Uh, this is an optional part of this mine with some very difficult enemies in it that I had to power level to be able to survive long enough to get through. But there's some powerful armor down here. Um, but the way Final Fantasy 1 works and the way this game works is that every single enemy in the game has a morale value, a morale score. And um, the very first thing they do whenever they're going to take an action is they check to see if they run away. And in Final Fantasy 1, that includes the final boss, Chaos, can run away from you. But they've just set the morale score of Chaos very high. But uh, you can change that with the fear spell. But anyway, these enemies here have morale scores that are um, not as large as what their abilities are. So they're appropriate level for me to be fighting, but they are escaping from me with some regularity, which makes uh, power leveling a little bit uh, more difficult. The morale score works by doing a check against what your character's level is in Final Fantasy 1 and, and in this game. So the higher your levels are, the more likely enemies are to uh, escape because there's a random uh, generator check to see if they run away. Well, in Final Fantasy 1 Vanilla, you have to really, really be uh, overleveled of an enemy before they start to run away. Um, you need to be in uh, very high levels even before like the first imps of the game start to run away from you. And you're, you're not going to see any um, enemies in the later game flee from you even at very high levels. So it's very interesting to see that. I assume that that was meant to be a balance against escaping from enemies here because uh, you have to succeed a, um, a check to run away. And in Final Fantasy 1, you, you can have four characters who are having a check to escape. In this one, you only have one character who's making that check. So the uh, balance tilts a little bit more in favor of the enemies in this game. Now, thankfully... Uh, the designers of this game have balanced that by, uh, at least as far as I've seen, not having any very large enemy groups, which is very convenient that we don't have groups of like seven or eight enemies uh, piling up on one character. I, I don't think they could have made a game that has that and have this character survive. So um, I'm seeing groups of, of three enemies is about as large as I will see enemy groups. Um, so we're heading out of this dungeon. Um, these render robots, I did beat uh, a battle with them once and they give 700 something experience which is pretty nice but they, uh, you really have to rely on luck and I spent a lot of time trying to get this uh, successfully crawled, this optional area. Again, you can just walk right through that mine, it's a short one room passageway. But uh, I went down into that area to get the, to get the high level items. And uh, as you see the game sound effects and the video desyncing, you'll uh, if you've been watching this series, um, I've talked about recording this on, on a Mac computer on purpose to see what the Mac user experience is for uh, gaming and recording. And I talked about in that one being less than impressed with that experience. And uh, even on a pretty, pretty powerful Mac computer, um, I have problems with recording and syncing because Macs have to use so many workarounds to get programs like this working. So I have to have a, um, a separate audio... Uh, multiple output channel playing just so that I can capture a game with audio and then the uh, audio and visual recording desyncs on OBS on Mac because the computer is lagging so I have to try to balance what the um, desync you can you can desync your audio and video to line that up when you're capturing video but uh, normally you don't have to do that you can just record it in real time but because there's some uh, processing lag there, I have to try to guess what the lag rate is going to be. And when the game is experiencing slowdown um, at different rates, then uh, you'll see this desync pop up. So I hope it's not too irritating. So we, uh, we went through Eisenfort. We're heading to the next town to the southwest. Um, and then we're going to go to the aqueduct 
that is up there at that next town. That's really our, uh, our next mission here. And these enemies, as I'm power leveling on them, are going to start to escape a little bit more often. I'm going to get the hover bike out again to go across the swamp, so I've got that travel item. Uh, there's a railjet track, so I assume I'll be able to take that later. That'll be pretty nice to pick that up and, and explore the world a little bit more efficiently. They've gated that a little bit like Final Fantasy 1, where in the earlier game, you are uh, taking a long time to move around because you're just walking over land, fighting lots of battles, uh, using lots of resources. You've got a lot of heal potions, and you've got a lot of uh, their uh, the antidotes in this one, the poison herbs, the pure potions in uh, Final Fantasy 1 Vanilla. So the early game is meant to be pretty grindy, and you have to really battle through just to get from place to place. You have to really push it. Uh, thankfully, there are no random battles with the hover bike, but uh, unluckily, there is no dash button with the hover bike. So you cannot dash with the hover bike, but uh, you do not have to worry about any random battles. That's why I, cho I choose to take this bike across the swamps whenever I can. And we're going to pop into this town here and see what kind of information they have and arms and armor. And at first glance, you can actually see I exit out here to save the game because the tiles of this of this town look like a dungeon. And it has the music of a dungeon, but except, welcome to Sansia. <laughs> so this is the town right there. So our water has become polluted. Someone has poisoned the water hole and it's wreaking havoc on people's health. Here's another anachronism. Water's green and tastes like eggs. I'm a getting the runs from it, I tells ya. So another bit of real world um, <laughs> problems coming into uh, our fantasy world here. Clearly their water is being poisoned by something that is making ha people have uh, digestive problems. Which is not something you usually think about in, uh, in fantasy games. I'm thinking of the uh, Doma water poisoning sequence in uh, Final Fantasy VI where you see the water turn purple, and then you start to see people just falling off of the castle ramparts. What a, a beautiful and uh, disturbing scene that is to play through. So we're getting a few more clues. Here's another look at Skiffles. And uh, during the capture here, if you're ever seeing um, a camera icon pop up in the top, as you see right there, that's me just capturing screenshots uh, to keep records on my Twitter account. By the way, active underscore ATE on my Twitter account. So I am kind of in real time tweeting up those updates. Those These videos uh, won't be posting in real time. They post once a week. As you'll know if you are a subscriber to this channel, which you can do. Uh, anyway, so we're looking at the weapons that we have for sale here. I am going to end up buying that wave cannon. The impact gun does not give me as much a bonus, so I am going to end up buying that. So there's a labyrinth that lies to the east of all kinds of weapons. I have not seen that yet as, as of this playthrough. I'll have to try to remember that. That may be a side quest that I need to try to find. But um, right now I'm going to just try to advance the plot of this game, move on through a few things, and uh, and get, get the railjet. Kind of do some backtracking, which is required uh, with key items, and we're going to try to unlock that railjet. So now we're heading to the aqueduct that is to the north of them, and they talk about the um, the controls. The control switch for the aqueduct is locked by some uh, very strong bars. There's some strong, I guess, iron bars that are locking the uh, the switch, and these people in the town do not have access to anything that can open those iron bars. So. Here we are in the aqueduct, and that is where we're going to end this video. Next video, we're going to explore this aqueduct, see what's inside. We're going to find those bars. We're going to get a key item to go on for the next segment of the game. If you like this video, feel free to hit that thumbs up button. Subscribe to the channel if you'd like to, and leave me a comment with what you're thinking about this hack. If you want to try to play it, if you want to look at it, or if you have any questions about anything that I see. We will talk to you next time.